such a thrill to do this. It's so great that everybody's here and as people are so interested in this story. What, what do you think it is about this story, you know, about Christine Bott that, has, that captures people's imaginations that weren't there in the 60s and early 70s and that weren't part of this, this kind of quite rarefied small scene? I think essentially it's because it's a hidden story. I think people have got their own experiences and accounts and knowledge of the time, but to have the person that was actually part of this whole caper, as Chris called it, the story that went out was basically about the undercover police operation. Chris went into hiding after she came out of prison, as did Richard, the main chemist. And essentially, I think, it was kind of heartbroken because <laughs> she truly believed all the things that you've just heard Simon express. She really believed it would be the thing to help mm -hmm. save the planet. And she never stopped believing that up to the point of her death when I was her death partner. And so given that you became good friends with her in the end, yeah. um, was it difficult to tell Christine Bott's story objectively? Well, that's been the challenge. But because this book is her own words, mm -hmm. then I don't have to worry about representing her story because she's written it. So what's the difference? We've, we've got two books that we're, yeah. we're launching today. Yeah. Uh, we've got After Julie, The Kemp Tapes, yeah. and then The Untold Story of Christine Bott. What's, they're, they're intrinsically linked. Yes. What is the difference between the two books, apart from the fact that the one is in Christine's work? Yes. So without the first book, the second one wouldn't have happened. Because as a result of self-publishing Christine's memoir, her partner of the time, you know, of the era, Richard <laughs> Kemp, rang me up and said, I want to tell you my story. So after 45 years of silence, he he decided to go on record and talk about his his recollections at the time. So that kind of made the second book inevitable, really. Because people have there are people who are still alive who remember it and remember them and remember the story and remember the arrest. But they've not heard from Richard since. So there's the there's the stuff that I had which I got through Freedom of Information, which was her arrest interview. And then there are the accounts of how it was reported in the press. And then there's bits about what she did post-prison. And then there is our friendship and how she decided finally that she wanted her voice heard. And she wasn't, in a way, it was having to hide herself for so long when she sort of started to realised that she didn't have very long left on the planet kind of thing. But the urgency started about, I want to get my story heard. I want to get it told. Uh, so it is a multi-layered, multi-faceted story, isn't it? It just keeps on unfolding, really. The story is still evolving as I hear more from different people and different people reach out that knew Chris or I find more of the writing, so it's still, it's still unfolding, and yes, it's got a lot of synchronistic things happening. So I kind it of it sounds like an LSD trip in itself. <laughs> I feel slightly spaced yeah. out. <laughs> Can everyone hear us, by the way, or do you want yeah, to? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and so, how did you originally meet her? Yeah, so that in itself was uh, extraordinary, really. Um, I'd had my own experience of being a teenage runaway and had gone through all sorts of traumas yes. and finally decided that I wanted to, I found, I came across a psych, certain type of psychology which is by a guy called Carl Rogers which is called the Person Centered Approach. I've got some people here who also are interested in that approach. Thank, thanks everybody for coming by the way. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> And uh, there was a course, a diploma in my local city, so I got offered a place. And 
in the first week on this particular course, you tell your story and why, why you're there. And uh, Chris said that she'd been imprisoned for conspiracy to flood the world with LSD. That is how she put it. <laughs> <laughs> you could kind of, that would be a good opening gambit. <laughs> yeah, I, think, I don't think my opening gambit would be so nice. Because uh -huh. mine would be, actually, I was straight for LSD. As a runaway. So, so how did you uh, how did you land up getting traded for LSD as a runaway? In a nutshell. In a nutshell, Jonathan. <laughs> I know it's a, we haven't got three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so, have, but how, I mean that's an extraordinary yeah. tale. Is what what happened to you? Because that, in a way, this story mm -hmm. none of it would have resonated with you without that happening to I you know. at such a vulnerable age. Yes, exactly, exactly. So I grew up in a family which essentially was, um, we were all a bunch of hippies. Well, me, great nephew. <laughs> now my brothers were all beating it to drop out, and I was the youngest, and we lived just near London, and you know, there was so much going on, the music scene, everything was happening, the whole era, it was very much in my household, but it was very separate and different to how we were being brought up. And I ended up running away, <clears throat> thinking that I was going into a, a more free life, because our family life was very Catholic and very um, sort of strict in that respect, but also strangely liberal. It's such an odd mixture. And I ended up sort of on the road in Morocco with a guy who turned out to not be particularly nice. And he had some acid, which he then decided he wanted to get rid of me. So he passed me on to some other traffickers and dealers. And so I was put into their house. So what, you, they kind of, he thought he had ownership of you? Yeah, yeah. And he actually ended up, he wants to go to Morocco and find heroin, which I had no idea that that was in any way even <laughs> part of the picture. I was very much a sort of hippie chick. Yeah. There to be, bells and all of this stuff, but he wasn't particularly nice and just saw me as a good means of trafficking, of going, because if you've got a girl hitching on the side of the road, sure. someone's going to pick you up. So yeah, so <clears throat> that part of the story was very, very hard, obviously. So you were actually traded for a suitcase full of drugs? Yeah, kind of, except yes, he's very small. Yeah. <laughs> so it wasn't a suitcase. And at what point did you kind of, <laughs> um, at what point did you kind of think, okay, I've sort of slept, sleepwalked into this very dark world? Well, it's bizarre, Jonathan, actually, because when we were on the road and before this trade had happened, we all took some LSD. We were with a couple of guys who were the smugglers, these two German guys. And we were waiting to get a ferry to go over to Morocco, or Spanish Africa, as this part is called. And we all took some LSD. And I was on the, this was right on the shore. And I had a huge experience on it, which I can still remember. And it kind of, kind of told me it's going to be okay. Whatever happens next, you're going to be okay. And that never left me, that sense that it was going to be okay. But, crikey, it took a long time to get okay. It nearly wasn't okay. It really nearly wasn't okay. It was horrific for about six or seven years. It was pretty bad. However, what I then had first-hand experience was how our country responds to trauma. So as a kid, when I came back, having um, been traumatised, raped, beaten up, all of that sort of thing. I was put into a mental hospital and given electric shock treatment. Mm -hmm. And I was kept there for a year as a 17-year-old in an asylum with, you know, women who I would probably describe as looking like old witches, long white hair, crooked noses. An asylum which had lots and lots of corridors and a very scary place, and I was basically wandering around, you know, this place as a kid. So when I came out of there, it took me quite a long time to get my life in any sort of order. It took years and years, really. But 
that I knew that the response I'd had from that system was wrong. It wasn't how you treat people if they're in trauma. So I think it was about maybe 15 years later that I came across the theories of Carl Rogers. I really liked what he had to say. I had to go on this course, got on the course. In the meantime, I'd been to art school and got a degree and all that sort of thing. And had lots of other things happen as well, which weren't particularly easy. Um, but then I met Chris. And so our stories kind of, it was like a circle joining up. Symbiotic. Yeah, yeah. So she was, she was mortified, but I think also... <clears throat> relieved to meet someone like me that had gone through that stuff that she hadn't really thought about. So, so, in terms of her um, involvement by proxy with this idea of um, flooding the world with LSD, which was really her partner with the architect behind it, but did she then, do you think she under, she had never actually thought of the, the palpable consequences that affected people's lives on a, in, in reality, to people like you? Because ultimately, they were a couple of lunatics who spread psych, dangerous psychedelic drugs to the world, and you were the example A to Z of what can go wrong. Did you think she was aware of that? Well, I guess I wouldn't frame it quite. I know right. you <laughs> <laughs> That's my <job. laughs> But basically, do you think she never, th that her and Richard Kemp had ever thought of the consequences, the dark side of what they were doing? She writes in her book, because I can only go by what she's written, mm. or what she said to me. Oh, I need you to honest. So in her book, really? she said she knows that she didn't think too much about the street level of how yeah. she And if we think about it, you know, at the time there was no internet, there were no mobile phones. So whatever was happening in parts of the country which were tragedies, the chances of them actually knowing about it are pretty low. But they'd hear about it. Yeah, and, 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 and do you, th do you think um, they felt like they were kind of connected to the rock and roll world? No. Because they, as characters, weren't. They were no. quite cerebral characters, weren't yeah, they? Yeah, they were but academics. Do you, do you find it, and I'm sure this is what attracted most people here to the to the story, it's it's the correlation between this story and the counterculture. So ultimately, you had whether it was Jimi Hendrix or the Beatles or Traffic or Bob Dylan or the Beat Poets, William Burroughs, Allen Ginsberg, Ferlinghetti. All of these characters were directly influenced by psychedelic drugs. Yeah, and it's fascinating how. What, what, uh, what, what was the percentage of psychedelics that were going out into the Western world came from this little place, this little cottage in Wales? It was like three quarters of the Eighty percent of the drugs in the Western world were coming out of this cottage made by this couple of I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? The effect they left an indelible mark on the cultural landscape. Didn't they? they surely did. I think. Chris was a disciplined person, yeah. so I think it was hard for her to <coughs> imagine that anyone would be foolish enough to be undisciplined. Because when she, when she first met Richard, am I right in saying she didn't like him on smoking a joint? Yeah, 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 she chucked him out. For smoking a joint? Yeah, yeah. And then within a couple of years, weeks, <coughs> week, she's hoovering up LSD? Yeah. <laughs> How does that work? <laughs> he must have been good in bed. <laughs> okay, now. I mean, but you, so you don't think she'd ever kind of thought of the, the the mark they were leaving on the culture, or what they what he was actually doing in reality? Well, no, she was because she thought that anyone who took it was going to have that sort of beech tree experience, you know, connecting to the cells of the beech tree and have the sacred connection to all life, and that then they would sort of adjust their lives accordingly to that psychedelic experience. Which is a, a fair, there's a, there's a big argument to say that's right. If you talk to Paul McCartney or Stevie Winwood, you talk to the people that did these drugs and then created the art 
to put the frame around the psychedelic picture and took it into this this took it into the mainstream, the center of the mainstream. Their intention was love. Yeah. It was like, oh look, yeah. Sergeant Pepper, yeah. traffic getting it together in the country. The idealistic um, take on that thing, which was articulated through the airwaves of the world. Yeah. You know, that's the good side of it. The bad side of it is people are losing their mind. Mm. Potentially. Um, she does acknowledge that in the book. Oh, no, I know. Yeah. And I think there's lots of ways for people to lose their minds. Mm. And there's a lot of... Now that it's coming sort of into the mainstream again, LSD, psilocybin, you know, people are looking at it to treat people, which I kind of feel is a bit questionable. But... Um, those that are studying it are very reluctant to actually even identify LSD as a drug. What do you mean? So drugs drug you, yeah? So right. they either make you dopey, you know, cannabis can make you dopey, yeah. Yeah. speed will wake you up, cocaine will wake you up, you know, it's sort of drug, immediate effect. LSD is you an experience. So, okay. Which is, you know, so they see it as, I don't know how they might call it, what they might call it, but the thing, I mean, one of the things that connects me to Simon is that we both worked in an addiction agency in Norwich, I was there for about nine years, and in all that time, I never met anyone who was addicted to LSD. No. Everybody no. that came through the doors were using alcohol, speed, heroin, you know, whatever. That was, those were the drugs that people were getting addicted to. So having heard this story, and then having heard, read about it, because it is one of the most infamous stories in the counterculture history, did your perception of her change once you got to know her? Christine Bob. So when she told her story on the course, you know, I, I sort of had this moment of thinking, you could be my nemesis, right. you know, and um, what, what are you going to think when you hear my story? Mm. And I've heard a little bit about Operation Jubilee, I was aware of it, but because of Christine's character, I don't mean personality, I mean character, and because of her integrity, and because of the encounters that I saw her go through, and that we both went through during the course of that, process of sort of shedding yourself with mm. sort of prejudices and things like that. I just felt I met a very authentic person who had very strong values that remain true throughout my knowledge of her. Because that is that is the central thing that comes out in the new book, The Untold Story of Christine but is this this palpable sense of purity and truth running through her life like a stick of rock. Would you agree with that? Well, it's one of the last things she said before she died. All that matters is truth and poetry. Hmm. How amazing. Yeah. And this is now, I mean, obviously I had my trauma of being in this crazy asylum as a kid. She spent five and a half years, she spent two of those years in Durham Jail which is a male prison in a wing, which was for the 36 most dangerous women in the country. That's crazy, isn't it? <coughs> and so that's however, however you look at her, I mean, she shouldn't have been put in that position. Yet she came out without bitterness and without vengeance and without, you know, she had no, nothing in her that wanted to yes? harm anyone. But what it did give her, as well, was a, a clarity. She might have been a bit harsh in some of the things she said if she thought people were messing up in their lives, if they weren't facing their realities. Because she was a doctor. Because she was a doctor and because she was also someone that believed that people had potential that they could fulfill if they had the courage to do it. And, and, and the last book, um, after Julie the Kent text, that sort of weaves police interviews, newspaper cuttings and reports, and a recent set of interviews that you did with 
um, Richard Kemp into the narrative? How did you interweave all of those different elements? I think I just had to bite the bullet and get on with it. Because I've tried and tried to find a publisher, I've tried to find an agent, I've tried to engage sort of the publishing world in, in getting the book done, getting some kind of, you know, expert, if you like, help. And then I thought, I'll sort it, I'll just do it, because <laughs> no one's helping me. And most people who've read it like it. They, they, you know, it reads well, apparently. People it reads, love it, don't they? <laughs> but but you've now you have mainstream interest. You you've got movie companies circling around this story. You have mainstream interest. The BBC have done a whole series on it, yeah. narrated by Rhys Yeah. I mean, it's incredible how this story has suddenly this there's, there's been this momentum built up yeah. in terms of the interest. You've got all of these people here now. What do you yeah. think it is about this story that is now suddenly seems to be connecting with something? I think the initial wish, you know, that this would help society is very much on the ascendant still. You know, we've got the evidence of the climate, we've got the evidence of all of the things going wrong that were being predicted in the 60s through the Club of Rome. The Club of Rome report, which Richard told me about, I'd never what heard of it. Yeah, I hadn't heard of it. Because when I was trying to dig into Richard, because I didn't have these conversations with Chris when she was alive, what I had was her memoir. Yeah. But when I met Richard, I just wanted to dig in to find out what, mm -hmm. what motivated you, what really motivated you. And initially, he was kind of a bit blasé and said, well, we were criminals and businessmen. Yeah. You know, and I, I said, well, you know, a lot of people are sort of moved by the music and the time. You know, was there not something going on for you? And he said, well, yeah, yeah, the Club of Rome report. And I said, well, what was that? He said, well, that, that was the report that told us that if we were going to continue going in the direction that we're going in, then we're going to face an environmental disaster. From a sociological? Environmental, ecological point of view. And so what... what he was a scientist. So Richard had never talked to anyone publicly. He'd, after he'd come out of prison. How long did he go to prison for? He got 13 years, and he served six. And how long did she go to prison for? She, got, um, she was sentenced to nine years, and she served five and a half. That's so right. proportionally, she got, harsh, she got very harsh She served she, longer than him. It's ridiculous. She was a woman, because she was an academic, she was part of the establishment. What did, you make of Richard, what did you make of Richard? Were you looking at him thinking... You basically screwed up my friend's life. Not initially. <laughs> <laughs> what was your perception of him? So, he was extreme, honestly, the first phone call that I got from him, he, he was so emotional and really grateful because he realised that I'd been her death partner. Right. And the idea that she hadn't died alone meant an awful lot to him. And was she aware that you you had been I'm part of this story? Was he aware? Because he just disappeared into you know. Yes. He was he, in, he, he's he been hiding. Me from he didn't know he's he's been he, hiding out. So he didn't have a clue who I was until he got a copy of the book and a letter from me. Yeah. And was it difficult to persuade him to actually talk to you? He rang me up. But to persuade, he was not initially willing to do an interview, isn't that right? Not so, well, no, as soon as he contacted to me, he was happy to do an interview. Right. And what, so what were your impressions on him? Did you, did you like him, or did you kind of in the end think, I don't like him? Let's say I wouldn't seek out his friendship. There's no need, for, yeah, no need for diplomacy, okay? <laughs> so he was basically... But he was quite a sad character, wasn't he? I feel, I'm, I'm lost, sad. I feel, sad I feel huge respect for him. I feel sorry for him. I, I think he's okay. But I didn't feel a natural warmth that I felt with Chris. He was a very different kettle of fish, let's say. And I guess when you say about, you know, how I might have told the story, in a way, because I had imagined, because Chris loved him, I imagined he was a bit similar as a person Idealistic. to Chris. Then the shock when I realised actually he wasn't quite the same. 
as Chris in that respect. So ultimately, do you think his original goal was was quite an idealistic one to enlighten the world with psychedelic drugs, or on reflection, do you think he was simply a drug manufacturer? He believed that he could check. He when he got so emotional when I got you know did that digging in bit which I mentioned to you, you know, earlier about wanting to find his motivation. And he got really, really sort of excited, slammed his fist into his hand, you know, I'm the man, I'm the man that can do this. I can change the world. I've got the right qualities, I've got the right ideas. He sounds I've got incredibly the egotistical. Yeah, well, he, but that was it for him. That's, that, that was the sort of, the penny dropping for him at He the was time. going to change the world with he, his scientific he, genius. Yeah. Because ultimately, psychedelic drugs were actually meant to reduce the ego. Well, <laughs> no, so I, originally, yeah, quite. Um, <laughs> uh, what Hoffman was involved in was manufacturing something that was going to help stop people bleeding to death. Oh, yeah. How's that one? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that, if you're off your face enough, it's the blood. Yeah, so it, it somehow it inhibits the blood cells. Oh, right. So it was for, obviously very useful in war, ironically, to stop people from bleeding. And also, bizarrely, childbirth, stopping women from bleeding to death, having given birth. So that was the, yeah. That was the. Is that real or is that that was impossible? That's true. Really? Yes. Wow. That's what they were doing the research for, and then realised that this, what whatever it was called, LSD twenty five, didn't have those qualities. Hoffman then took it and had this experience. Wow. And there, there it is. That's that was what it was being. That was what the intention was. There was no intention of it being anything to do with the mind or, you know, exploring anything mentally. It was. And so all the all the money that uh, Richard Kemp had made manufacturing eighty percent of the world's LSD, where is all the cash? <laughs> Probably to um, the Brotherhood of Eternal Light or David Solomon or Ronald Stark or Good. whoever. So who are they? Those, those are the other people that, that came over from the States who basically set Richard up. They had hunted Richard. They weren't chemists. So they, they don't sound like the corporate headhunter job. <laughs> <laughs> well, Solomon was a jazz head. I mean, he was a very interesting guy. And who were the brother head, brotherhood of eternal, eternal love? love. Fantastic. <laughs> it sounds like a, a band from 1967. <laughs> well, they were, that, they were around at that time. And so... Because Christine left me all of her books, I got one of the books is uh, called Timothy Leary's Jail Notes, and it's got an introduction written by Alan Ginsberg. And I tried to contact, it was copyrighted to Village Voice, and wow. I, I tried to get their permission to reproduce the entire introduction because it's such a brilliant introduction. And they wouldn't let me, so I had to brace the aspects of it for after Julia Kemp takes. But in it, Ginsberg goes into <laughs> the story of this guy called Frank Takes a Gun, who was a Native American guy. And I guess you having met Dr. John, you'll know a little bit about all of this kind of culture that he was talking about and that was there. And so Frank gets a gun, set up a church, which meant that he could continue using his peyote. So the Brotherhood of Eternal Love also did that. Because we don't also, we, we don't think of this stuff happening here, do we? I always, mm -hmm. In my kind of fairy tale book of rock, psychedelic rock and roll, I think of all of it coming from America. Sure. It's interesting that this, and all the, most of the LSD, when you, if you listen to or watch the, the movie of Woodstock, where they're warning people about don't take the brown acid, all of that acid came from these people in Wales. That's right. Because they put too much of a dose of acid in the, when in it, the microdot. When it got to America, yeah. So the... The stuff Richard sent over in itself was fine, but when it arrived in America, they double dosed it. That's crazy. Yeah, because they probably hadn't had it as pure before. 
So they used the amount that they would normally use with what was being manufactured over there. And do you think, because he doesn't strike me as a counterculture kind of guy. Richard. Which he seems to me to be a kind of slightly delusional, quite wanting to be perceived as quite a cerebral uh, character. I think he's, he's, he's just a dope smoking hippie. No, but I'm saying he's kind of almost like the kind of, he wants to be seen as, as, as coming from the sort of librarian end of the counterculture. Whereas actually the, we, the, the reason most of us know about um, psychedelic drugs and, and the counterculture and whether it does or doesn't get televised is because of rock and roll at Woodstock and the Beatles and creation and all of that's that hat shash and the colour cut. That's how we know about it. Timothy Leary. Yes, I tried to talk to Richard about being creative because I think, you know, part of what LSD can offer is that idea of the imagination and being creative and doing creative things. Mm. And he felt that he really wasn't creative, that Chris was the creative He's person. He's a scientist. He's a scientist, yet that when he was in prison, he did all of this leather work. And he showed me pictures of all this beautiful leather tooling that he could got to use in prison. And I said, but that, that's creative. And he said, it's just a craft. So it's almost, well, actually, the other bit that I'm remembering, he didn't particularly like LSD. He sounds like that. <laughs> <laughs> do you think he was, do you think he was, um, a slippery, disingenuous character. Oh, Jonathan, stop saying this kind of thing. He sounds to me like he wasn't quite sure how, whether, what was him and what was the way he perceived himself, like this self-fulfilling film that he was projecting onto you and probably anyone else who he was talking to. Because also, I must say, Catherine, no, he hadn't talked to anyone. He was probably talking to someone in the local bar, maybe. But he hadn't publicly talked to anyone until you came along. Yeah. So you kind of, in, do you think this was a, do you think it was a process, it was a f form of catharsis for him to open up to you? I think he's, because they've li they lived their life, they lived a double life. So they were very used to being two things. So Drug were, manufacturers. And counterculture revolutionaries. Yeah, small holders. Yeah, growing vegetables. Yeah, so right. I think for Richard to actually be himself, he possibly needed to do something similar to what Chris did. Mm. So Chris went into psychology, she got into her own processes, she sort of did this year that I did as well. You know, she wrote a lot. She, you know, she really worked on her shit, so to speak. So, but so your professional background is what exactly? Person centered counselling. Right. And so, how much of that experience did you bring into this thought to to to, to the narrative that you weaved with these two books? How how in tangible terms, how important was that? Yeah, I think it was such an important part of my friendship with Chris, that she also liked the theories of Carl Rogers. I've got an interview in the book with the professor that trained both of us, Brian Thorne. Um, I, he, he was basically at Kiel in the 60s when everybody was taking LSD. And he's got a hilarious account of all the students, because it was a residential university, Kiel. And uh, so the students and the staff all lived on campus. And he said, Brian's very particular, and you won't mind me mimicking him. <laughs> so, picture this, Catherine, picture this. There's a 400 students all sitting on the grounds outside of the vice chancellor's office, and they're all humming <laughs> in the sheer belief that they're going to levitate the building. <laughs> I did see people doing that yogic flying once. I, well, I saw George Harrison's last gig, at the, which was at the Albert Hall, and that was a benefit for the Natural Law Party. Yeah, yeah. And the support act was basically a bunch of these nut jobs <laughs> doing yogic flying on the stage. And so I saw it with my own eyes. But they were actually levitating. Yeah, yeah, I saw it. 
Do some recovery. I was on no drugs whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> Half a lager and a packet of cheese and onion crisps. Yeah, really. It was, it was, yeah, I saw it. I mean, I don't know what. And it's so fat, but it's so fascinating. It's like you, you look at, um, I love the idealism of those times. And then, but I also think to myself, well, how much did this change the world? And actually, I think it completely changed the world. Yeah, you know, right. I don't think drugs. I don't, I think that I think the overall, from an emotional perspective, I think it wasn't the drugs that changed the world, but it was the attitude around the drugs. So people's idea of saying, okay, we're actually going to free ourselves from the shackles of conventional society. And that was, in essence, was what became more important than the drugs. I agree. So I talked to Paul McCartney several times, and he said to me, well, actually, our real intention was um, to spread a message of positivity to the world. And if you look at the Beatles um, song catalogue, um, they, the, the love is probably the word mentioned more than anything else. And to me, that personifies everything about the counterculture and about the psychedelic revolution. Because in a way, psychedelia is not necessarily a thing that's intrinsically linked to drugs. It's actually a state of mind. Mm -hmm. Hence the joke of hug a tree or whatever. It's actually a thing of saying, you know what, we can look at the world from a different perspective. Because like when you're an art, at an art gallery, yeah. you can look at a painting from a different angle and see something new. And in, the, in essence, this story their stories about drugs, or certainly Richard's, but really from an emotional, romantic perspective, the story is about actually looking at the world from a different angle, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think this is what Chris and I experienced in the sort of the approach, in the plus essential approach, in dialogue. If you're in dialogue with someone, and you're really listening to them, and you're being interested, you can alter your frame of mind, you can alter your experience, you can, you can shift into a different reality. I think you can, you know, it's like falling in love. Falling in love is like the drug. If you fall in love yeah. with someone, yeah. you're just, your head's all over the place. So it's, a, it's tapping into that potential and into that consciousness, which I think you're right. Post-50s, post that to the Second World War and all of the horrors, People need to break through right. to something else, and this was a means to do it. And I think just because it didn't quite work out the way they hoped it might doesn't mean it can't again, that something can come from this. And I think you asked me earlier, why are people interested now? Mm. I think it's because people are still wanting, they're still seeking, they're still wanting to make life easier for us. But really, and the further and further we get away from this, the idealistic um, perception of the 60s counterculture, the more hermetically sealed off we are from the world, living our lives inside these screens, never going out, never talking to anyone. This is refreshing because there's a shared communal thing here where people are actually interested in this subject. So you've got us, then you've got people listening, and then the thing in the middle of it is this idealistic thing of, oh, we can actually, we don't have to live our lives hermetically sealed off from the world. And that is a direct, there's a direct correlation between that and what these people were trying to do, which is, oh, we can actually look at things from a different perspective, live a different life. And that's in a way what the counterculture was about and the psychedelic revolution was about. It wasn't actually about for us, was it? No, I think it was The a headline means. was drugs, wasn't it? Was it? A means. The, the, the drugs was a vehicle to yeah. try and get you closer to this idealistic way of, of looking at the world. It was a super zappy vehicle. I think yeah. this is what the attraction was to them at the time. Was, you know, okay, we can go and meditate in the Himalayas. We can go and do, you know, yoga yeah, yeah. flower, flying. We can do shamanic practicing. We can get into this altered state. Or it can take us LSD. It's like that magic bullet idea that people are constantly looking for to treat difficult things that happen in the world right. and in life. Because that, the, that was the shot the Beatles got when they went to Rishikesh. It was like, number one, they realised that Maharishi was flesh and blood. So he wanted to sleep with yes. um, Prudence Farrow, wasn't that? I um, met him. I met him and his girlfriend when I was a kid. And it was like, 
I'm a Catholic, you're meant to be the head of something. You don't sleep with random people. <laughs> well, how did you meet the Maharishi? Um, so, a friend, um, her family invited me on holiday and we went to the Bahamas, we went to a place called Paradise Island and we were next door to a yoga ashram and Maharishi was there. Of course you have to meet the Maharishi in the Paradise Island. I was, so was 14. He, like? he was, you know, um, <laughs> well, he was interested in, you know, whether I was going to be a teacher. He thought I was going to be a yoga teacher of some sort. Um, but he had this uh, red-headed woman that was his partner, so I didn't see him often. Um, <laughs> there, was a, there was a meditation boat, which we, we did puja ceremonies, also. and there was a guy called Ramachandra who did, who did astral flying, and he was, he was hardly visible, and he was, he was really thin and hardly ever looked awake, but he, he lived his life on the astral plane. So, you know, it was, it, was, it was all really sort of cosmic. But, and but people think, oh, this is kind of what I was saying before. It's like, people think this is all some yin-yang nonsense from Magic Roundabout. <laughs> you know? Because <laughs> Dylan from the Magic Roundabout, which was a TV so show in the 70s, his, his character was based on Donovan. Yeah. And if you've ever met Donovan, I mean, he personifies this whole idea. I mean, he's kind of a cartoon character of himself, Donovan. <coughs> but Donovan was one of the main people alongside the Beatles in Rishikos. Yeah. But those are the people that really, um, in tangible terms, they represented what this was all about. And of course, they were also hoovering up shedfuls of drugs. But <laughs> they did have this idea of wanting to change themselves and change the world with it by looking at it, by embracing it in a new way and from a new perspective. And I do think that's what these two books, in essence, are about. That's the purity and the truth at the centre of this story. And I think, you know, the person who I feel, you know, really earnestly tried to change things was John Lennon, cool. you know, along with Yoko. And all of those, you know, his, his, his massive camp, he had a massive campaign, you know, the loving and the daring, yeah. everything that they tried to do, and he sort of adopted the sort of more socially driven political element, not just the turn on tune and drop. But I think that took him, that took him away from from the essence of his mission. Interestingly, and in the end, he dissipated his own message by becoming a laughing stock. If you were around at the time, which I wasn't, but I know. Um, it's like, you know, all of that acorns for peace, bedding, this, this, this. The further they got into politics and protest, and they started being influenced, it's like, if you listen closely to the lyrics of revolution, he goes, you say you want a revolution, don't you know that you can count me out? And then he goes, in. So there's a double, there's a double entendre simultaneously. So the, 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 the Beatles are actually non-committal, because it's a bit like Extinction Rebellion now. Well, is this a good thing? Well, it's probably a cool idea. Do you want people blocking up the road so you can't make it to your hospital appointment? That's probably not a great PR message. It's a massive, it's a massive complicated process. But it hasn't changed, has no, it? it has big, that big debate hasn't actually changed <coughs> when you from see, then to now. When you watch Peter, was it, uh, who's the guy, Peter, who did the Let It Be remastered? The Peter Jackson. Peter Jackson. When you see Paul talking with George and John, I mean, He's looking at the paper. He's talking about politics. He's talking about Martin Luther King. He's talking, you yeah. know, it's very much they are engaged, working class kids. The they, Beatles were engaged with the world, and yeah. they they were there to articulate what was happening. I read an interesting thing the other day about Nina Simone, and she was saying um, the job of an artist is to articulate what's happening in their world now, at that time. So I think that's very interesting. So. And in the case of John Lennon, he talks about having a phase of, of being, of making um, uh, reporter's songs, or reportage songs, which was basically talking about what was happening then and there. So Attica State, the song, the stuff about, uh, that is the album Sometime in New York City. Because um, of course, the ballad of John and Yoko is a straight piece of reportage about his life and how he's being handed by the media and he goes off on uh, to get married and 
got this trail of media behind him. Um, but I do think it's fascinating how those characters did set out with this idealistic vision of changing the world. And I do think the drugs were at the center of it, but I think the drugs were just the, the vehicle yeah. that they took off from. They weren't actually the thing that was the essence of what was at the center of their message. I think there's a very interesting sort of parallel there because on the one hand, Chris loved John. She loved John really. When I met Richard, he said, and then you've got that idiot John Lennon. Are you serious? Yeah. I never liked this Richard from the start. <laughs> <laughs> what a prick. <laughs> so he really said that? Yeah. Wait, so what, would he, what didn't he like about John Lennon? Be quick, though. You don't need to go. I didn't go into it because I was just dumbfounded. Who said that? Because I adored John Lennon. I mean, so, you know, I, I was his guest. I wasn't going to, you know, I never got into a proper argument. But my mate Suzanne, who's sitting there, she was with me, and yeah. uh, you know, so I had Suzanne and her partner Kira, and the three of us were sort of hosted by Richard. It's a weird thing to say, isn't it? It was a very Unless you just don't like popular culture, and, which is fair enough when you say, I'm going to uh, shoot back and shot the coat. <laughs> That's fine. But he, he said, Oh, that idiot, John Lennon. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you think, having written these two books, and they are unique books, like I don't know of anyone else who's written these kind of um, historical documents but taken them into uh, an accessible mainstream form in the way that you've done, and anyone who hasn't got these books, you should get them today, they're limited, um, they're amazing books. Do you, do you think, um, having written, you, you've immersed yourselves in this story for... Ten years? Mm. It's, a lot, it's a lifetime, isn't it? Mm. Um, do you, having had this close personal experience with the two main protagonists at the centre of this story, this, what was he, a kind of mad scientist, drug manufacturer, and then the woman that got swept up in it all, fell in love with him, and lands up carrying the can, half the can <coughs> for him. Um, do, has your perception of psychedelic drugs and the psychedelic era, do you think it's, it's is it more sinned against than sin? Is it, has, do you think psychedelic drugs and the psychedelic era have had a positive or negative force on the counterculture, on the underworld and the mainstream? And is that in a nutshell? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I personally wouldn't take LSD again. But do you think but I'm that glad would, I did. Right, but that, that's not what I asked you. Do you, do, you think that, do, you, do you think that stuff has had a positive effect on the world or a negative effect on the world in, on balance? It's, an, it's inevitably a mixture of both. But I Why? would say because people have their personal experience and people know of tragedies. I know of tragedies. You know, and sometimes... Sid Barrow. Well, there's Sid Barrow. Mm. And was, million others. Well, you, yeah. you know, I had a client who, although, <laughs> yeah, she was okay, but her partner would spike her with LSD really? without her consent. And I think this is another problem. It's not that, it's not that the actual drug itself necessarily will do the harm. It's the context in, in which it's done. Mm. It's consent, it's like a lot of things like sex, consent or no consent, you know, it's like these things, being honest and open and real and truthful, these are the things that we need to do to change the world, mm. Um, mm. not sort of try and manipulate people or... So it's the honesty know. that's, and the purity and the truth that's at the centre of the story, not the drug. The honesty, the authenticity, authenticity yeah. and owning mm. up to your own shit. You know, if people are scared of owning up to their own problems, then they'll do everything they can. But as we become more and it. more removed from the world by sealing yeah. ourselves off in front of a computer screen, maybe it's more and more difficult to actually see things from a real perspective because you're not even going shopping now, you're just pressing buttons. I think you're absolutely right. And I think, you know, another reason why I wanted to get this story sort of connected to people is because of nature, because of the natural world. Yeah. You know, Chris, 
She loved nature. I brought sweet peas with me that Simon tried to trash her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> these were her favourite plants, and I grow them every year in her memory. Wow. Um, yeah, and this is, you know, for me, this is a sort of, in a way, it's a celebration of Christie. This is? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that, but you've written the both books to tell the, her story and the story of the great caper, as they called yeah. it, yeah. for the first time. Yeah. Like, it's crazy that this story was not, not accurately out in the world or a fair representation of the story. Because Christine was just a forgotten footnote, wasn't she? Yes. I mean, there were people who were worried about what happened to her, and uh, subsequently, you know, those people that have heard about the book being out there have wanted to buy it and wanted to talk to me or be in touch with me. But there's the bigger story, you know, which is, I think, significant because the story that people know about are these sort of brave undercover coppers who did all this stuff. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, they're the ones that, you know, that's why Chris ended up in an H-ring in Durham prison and unable and to... And in a male prison as well, wasn't Yeah, it? I yeah. Mean, that's the crazy, there's yeah. so many crazy elements Yeah, the yeah, story. and, you know, so there's a... I can't, can't deny there's a bit of anger in me. Because Christine was <laughs> undoubtedly more sinned against than sinned, wasn't she? Yeah. Mm -hmm. She was a really beautiful person. She really was. And she was fierce and she was funny and yeah. And is there nowhere else? Has nobody ever else got hold of the, the, the central tenets of her story? It was untold until you came along. Yeah. 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 And it's cool, the untold story. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. But, and f final question before we open things up, if people are not asleep out there. Um, uh, from a cultural and sociological perspective, why is it important that the real story of um, Richard and Christie is now being told by you? Yeah, I think because it's very easy to demonise. It's very easy to buy, to have a binary, good, bad, you know, right, wrong. That's the world we're in, right? Not the world that I want to inhabit. No, but it's the world we're in, isn't it? It's Certainly very in terms much... of the mainstream media ma narrative. It's yeah. like it's a black and white world. Except Whereas actually it's... these stories are always yeah. a, a thousand different shades of grey. Exactly. Right? And there's all these uncomfortable realities. That actually, for millennia, people have been using psychedelics or have been using ways, you know, as, 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 a, as beings. Mm. There's something about being a person that needs to go into this altered space. And I had a... I, I went to a book launch by Ian McEwan, and there was a Q and A in that. And I asked him what he felt about going into, you know, going into an altered space, using the imagination, being creative. And he said, "Yes, it's a very interest. It's a very important idea. I think you need to, however you do it, you need to lose yourself. You need to go into a different space in order to let something else through." And I think some people do that through meditation, people do it through maybe getting hammered on alcohol, I don't know. People might do it on LSD. There's many, many ways. As, as human beings, we need that. And I think we also need to be, do what, like he said, not be behind screens. We need to have the I, thou encounter and see where we go, see where we get to. And is that the essence, in essence why you think it, it's important that these books are out in the world? and that you, you're telling this story? Well, I, I want Christine's voice to be heard, and I, I think it's a, a curious story. I think there's a lot of coincidences that happen that are interesting, and I think the message remains true, you know, peace, love, and understanding. Yeah. It's, you know, the, the That's such a cliche. Yeah. And it, it's interesting, isn't it, that actually it's, it's the most important thing in the world. Well, what's the opposite? War. War. <laughs> yeah. Want to go all Edwin Star? Like yeah. <laughs> you probably haven't got Edwin's moves. Probably not. But <laughs> maybe, like, uh, okay. maybe there's a hidden funky side to you that I can see. <laughs> <laughs> but well, I, mean, I have to say, I think both books are, are life affirming and fascinating. And I'm so glad you've you've written them and you're able to share this story with, with the world. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Can we show our appreciation?
Um, you can have a drink yeah, there and is come back. Food. And, and you can have a drink. <laughs> we've got some uh, fizzy pop and some prosecco. Um, and we can do some Q&As now.